Hi, and welcome to the Banker's View from Cybos video series, looking at all the hot topics here in Geneva. My name is Joy McKnight, I'm Transaction Banking and Technology Editor at the Banker, and I'm here with Tim Bosco, uh, Head of Innovation Strategy at Brown Brothers Harriman. Thanks very much for joining us today, Tim. Thanks for having me, Joy. So what main trends are you seeing within the fintech community globally? Well, I'll tell you, I think the, the term fintech is fairly generic, as you can imagine. It spans a pretty wide range of different types of solutions that are out there. When you look at kind of the core theme that runs across all of them, though, clearly it's digital transformation. And I guess what I mean by that is more about uh, sort of an efficient assembly of, of raw data into actually useful information that uh, any of our clients in, in across the, uh, the industry might, might need. Um, so when you, look at, uh, when you look at what's available What's really uh, here in terms of technology companies at, at Cybos, uh, what you tend to see is a lot of transaction processing, payments processing uh, uh, type companies. Um, and so you really think about it, the fintech tends to follow demand. Uh, and uh, so that that's obviously is a, is a huge opportunity. In the space that BPH operates, we're less of a transaction processing bank. So as a custodian and a fund services manager, and really the hot topics for us today are about uh, compliance, transparency, uh, the reliability of our systems uh, for our clients. So where we see fintechs emerging in our space, it tends to be more around things related to that. Uh, as an example, uh, identity management or um, KYC AML type applications. Uh, we even see that uh, we're approached often by fintechs that have uh, really uh, comprehensive systems for tracking in real time data flow throughout the multiple systems that we have at the firm. But do you see the fintechs as disintermediating the banks or do you really see them as a more of a collaboration play? Yeah, it, it, we really don't look at it as a, a relationship that's mutually exclusive in any way. Uh, we think about the relationship that exists, it's, it's really not uh, helpful to either party uh, to really create that type of dynamic. Uh, I, I think with um, uh, the opportunities that exist today, uh, really if you take it the perspective of the fintechs, uh, what they see in terms of uh, the opportunities of banks, banks have obviously the client reach that they need, the customer pipeline that they're hoping to build, and a lot of times, as I mentioned before, uh, the digital aspect of their solutions, the banks hold that really massive reservoir of data that they need to use in those applications to make them useful. So uh, we don't think that from the fintech perspective, they look at it as, as necessarily <coughs> an opportunity for them to disintermediate the banks. I think it's really a collaborative effort. When you look at the bank's perspective, um, think about how a bank might operate in a given year in terms of their budgeting process. Uh, there's really no uh, shortage of, of um, uh, problems that banks are looking to solve. There's no shortage of projects that they're looking to fund. And if you think about their prioritization process, oftentimes, what falls at the, at the bottom of that priority list tends to be the uh, product areas or, or uh, new solutions that maybe don't move the needle necessarily in any given uh, budget year. From a, fin from a fintech perspective though, uh, some of those opportunities that may not be needle movers for a bank could be huge opportunities for a fintech. So it, it comes down to a, a sort of a uh, incentive uh, difference between the two uh, groups. Uh, so we oftentimes as, as banks look at the fintechs as really taking up uh, uh, opportunities to improve areas of our firm that, that we aren't able to get to. So from that perspective, it certainly is collaborative. Uh, so do you really think that the banks need to take the sort of fail fast mantra of the fintechs in order to survive in this environment? I think that they do, um, and, and in a lot of cases they already are uh, fulfilling that, that sort of um, that mantra. Um, if you think about failing fast though as um, a way for banks to attempt to solve problems from a lot of different angles, even in the face of uh, the uncertainty of an outcome, sure, that absolutely makes sense. Um, but the stakes for a bank and the stakes for a, a financial services startup company are, are clearly very different. Uh, I don't think there are many banks today that like to use the word fail. Uh, I don't think, uh, particularly at, at Brown Brothers, we are seeking to fail uh, in, in anything we do. But it makes sense for us to uh, design our strategy around more of a portfolio approach, more than we've done in the past. And I think you see that as becoming more uh, common among banks. And that's something that I think we, we observe from, uh, from the startup community itself, not from an individual startup. Um, but it, the, the idea is for us to actually de-risk 
some of the prioritization, uh, some of the investment priorities that we have by having multiple options that span a full spectrum of uh, early stage re research and development to uh, prototypes that we can share with our clients, all the way to minimal viable products that are live in production, uh, and, and actually kind of have a portfolio that spans all sorts of uh, domains in our space as well. Uh, so by having that th those those different dimensions to our portfolio of, of, pro of products, uh, of product ideas, uh, we're better able to adapt when things change. Another thing I'd mention as well, and something that we can kind of take from uh, the behaviors, I guess, of startup, uh, the startup community, uh, at a large bank, you can imagine that there's a, a hazard that we actually have created in the past where uh, in order for us to... Um, initiate a project, a large project that we think has value to, the fir to our firms, oftentimes it requires support, obviously financial support, it requires support from senior leadership to, uh, to endorse. So there's an interesting hazard that potentially is created uh, in, uh, in some large organizations where if you're uh, interested in starting a, a really important project, uh, it requires support, financial support, it may require uh, endorsement from senior leadership. Um, so it takes some energy and time to, to get that support. Once you do, if you run into the situation where your project uh, changes course, if you learn something about the market, if you learn something about your client's needs, that changes uh, your approach, it sometimes is very hard to then shut that project down. And so uh, one of the things that we've learned uh, in, our, in our particular situation is it's actually helpful for us to intentionally limit the scope and the duration of some of the early initiatives that we have uh, in our innovation uh, portfolio. Um, and so typically we try to keep our projects to uh, under six months in duration, uh, some of the new early stage projects, uh, but also probably under half a million dollars at any given point in time. That helps us to stay nimble, so to speak, and it gives us an opportunity to hand off projects that are successful to the next stage of development. It also helps us to put projects to bed that didn't necessarily work out and not feel uh, that we've in, uh, impacted our financial position at all. Okay. That's great. Thank you so much for joining us today, Tim. Sure.